yeah here we go so good morning good afternoon and maybe good evening to all the members who have joined this webinar from respective countries welcome to this webinar organized by the process division of the india technical center mumbai i hope all of you are safe and doing very well wherever you are this is a uh, melind atray i'm a professor at iit bombay and the founding chair of the uh, imec uh, process division in india here today uh, uh, we have got a talk on data center cooling overview to be given by one of my colleagues here at iit bombay professor shankar krishnan and before we start his talk i will give a small overview or a biography about professor krishnan so professor shankar krishnan received his b engineering or be as we call in india in mechanical engineering from the psg college of technology india in year 2000 he received his masters which is ms in 2002 and a phd from in 2006 from the school of mechanical engineering perdi university usa he is currently an associate professor of mechanical engineering at iit bombay he was a staff thermal engineer and thermal team lead for the high performance computing product engineering team within the data center group at the intel corporation uh, prior to that he was employed at bell labs alcatel lucent as a post doctoral member of staff and a staff engineer scientist as battel pacific northwest national laboratory a us department of energy national laboratory his research and technical interests lie in the field of high performance cooling technologies multifunctional porous materials and non traditional thermal desalination methods he serves as a project reviewer for various government of india projects associated faculty at the department of energy here at iit bombay he was a faculty member of team shunya which is a project here at iit bombay it's india's first solar decathlon team and iit bombay ashri student net chapters advisor his work has received among other awards the 2014 r&d 100 awards and president of india cash prize award in 1998 he has more than 75 peer reviewed technical archival publications and 21 patents either granted or filed to his credit uh today's talk which is data center cooling focus on hpc he will discuss the purpose classes and emerging trends of data center cooling and will give emphasis uh, will be laid on the high performance computing data centers whose performance and growth are now being limited by both cost and power i'll not go in the details and give more time to professor shankar uh whatever questions you have you can press this right button which is a, a left side a pointed arrow on the right side of the screen and maybe you can write those questions and and they don't talk i'll give around 40 minutes to 45 minutes to shankar and then after that we can have four or five questions of course you can always send emails to shankar so uh, shankar the interest stage is for you please get started all the best thank you very much yeah. thank you professor atri i hope i am coming across well and uh, uh, hello from my end no and uh, um and namaste uh, so um as professor atri had introduced my name is shankar and i have given my email address at the bottom k shankar at iitb if you happen to have a question even after the webinar please feel free to email me um so uh, the the current talk will focus on data center cooling and data centers uh, is a very generic name which happen to refer to a warehouse size computer um and uh, so we'll try to focus on hpc which is my primary background hpc is high performance computing and uh, it's a it's a interesting area and i uh, will try to focus a little bit on that and i'll try to give you a, a basis and uh, go towards the emerging trends at the end so for the today's outline uh, what i wish to come across or get get across is that uh, first focus on why data centers uh, that why should we discuss them today or at uh, at any level and uh, then what is data center cooling why cooling is uh, is gaining more importance in a data center perspective and 
The third part is to focus a little bit on liquid cooling as uh, with an emphasis to uh, high performance computing. So, uh, so that's my outline. And finally, I, I'll end up with some of the emerging paradigms in this, uh, uh, in this uh, area, which is data center cooling. And uh, I try, I'll try not to focus too much on the component level, but rather on the practice of data center cooling. So moving on, and uh, you may have come across some of the um, headlines, um, such as that, for example, here's a uh, snippet from The Independent. It says, uh, it reads, global warming and data centers to consume three times as much energy in the next decade. And, uh, and the projected, some of the projections tend to be uh, so alarming that um, one may think that data centers are just uh, you know, consuming so much electricity. And this was published in 2016. And there have been some recent uh, uh, articles on these data centers where people have highlighted that you know, the global uh, electricity, uh, this is published in 2018 uh, in Nature, is that 20,000 terawatt hours of power uh, has been consumed, out of which the ICT, ICT is the Information and Communication Technologies, consumes itself by 2,000 terawatt hours. And about 200 terawatt hours is spent by the data centers, and another 200 terawatt hours is roughly spent by the communication technologies. But combining all of these, it says there's about 2,000 terawatt hours is being what consumed by these ICT sector which encompasses quite a few devices, quite a few mobiles, everything, including the communication networks and so on. At the last, uh, one piece that may actually be seen as something very small is the so-called Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin uh, industry is something, Bitcoin mining is something, is a very, very highly compute intensive job. And uh, what you end up seeing is that uh, um, the Bitcoin, uh, it consumes 20 terawatt hours, but some people have projected that the Bitcoin can end up being one of the largest consumers of power in the near future if this. And why is this? The reason one of the thing is that digitization uh, or uh, we have so many things that are now being digitized or uh, you are entering into the so-called information factories and where the internet is booming and the connections and the traffic, internet traffic is, if you see in 1987, only two terabytes of internet traffic was seen. In another 10 years, it grew to 60 petabyte. From there to 2007, it is about 54 exabyte. And 2017, it is about 1.1 zettabyte, which is extremely, uh, uh, I mean, very high rate of growth. And this is, supposed to continue as we go towards what is called the Internet of Things. And so more and more connected devices come into the market. And so this is going to explore, the, I mean, all these devices that are uh, going to communicate, they need data centers to communicate. So that is the central point. So the data centers are expected to grow. But we'll look at some of these, we'll have another look at these and see how people have done, uh, what people have done to uh, reduce the consumption of the ICT, power consumption of the ICT sector uh, over the last 10 years. And um, hof hopefully we can paint a much more greener picture than um, something uh, of what is shown here. So moving on, and one of the other interesting trends to look at is that if you look at over uh, two decades or uh, 15 years a period from 2002, if you see the the buttons that are the circles that are in orange are the ICT, blue is the energy companies, and the gray is other companies. So if you look at 2017, by market capitalization, the digital technology companies are primarily the top five companies. First is Apple, then comes Google Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. So these five different companies are now the market global leaders by market capitalization. Of course, energy companies lead in revenues, but 
this is showing how much uh, this digital technology has progressed over a short duration of 15 years. And uh, so that's, that's the premise behind this why data center is important. All these uh, companies employ data centers to uh, because you're using either streamed music or uh, cloud storage, cloud, uh, the variety of uh, online purchase, everything goes through a data center. So with that, um, I'll quickly jump into what are called the building blocks of a data center. So a data center, uh, if you were to walk from bottom up approach, is that you always start with the transistor. Current day, the transistors are the often uh, the quoted number is, you will see that it's seven nanometer transistor or technology or 10 nanometer. The 10 nanometer or seven nanometer refers to the, the distance. This is the so-called gate and this the specific distance between the two. So current day technology that is up, uh, that is sold in the market is 10 nanometers and uh, future will see more of the seven nanometers technology. And these transistors, these, this is a single transistor on the order of uh, nanometers, but they get integrated into what is called a silicon dye and that is on the order of a centimeter or so. And these transistors now, when they get integrated into a silicon dye, is it has to be connected. They all have to seamlessly work together. They cannot be operating uh, as an independent uh, computing entity, but rather they have to be integrated. So that's what the purpose of a silicon dye is to connect them by what is called on-chip interconnect. and and sometimes when you connect them, uh, <clears throat> if you want, but still at this silicon die stage, it is still not in a position to communicate with the external world. That is, you can't plug it to a wall that is, uh, for power. So you put a package around it, and that's what is called an off-chip interconnect that allows you to connect the silicon die to an external world. At this stage, we start to discuss about what is the heat dissipation. Uh, heat dissipation because the transistors, you are passing current through them. And uh, so there are the so-called joule heating losses and also the electrostatic discharge and charging and discharging of a capacitor always produces power. And we'll discuss a little bit on that aspect uh, in a slide or two from now um, after I go through the building blocks. And where you see is that the packages now start to produce power or heat. And that heat needs to be removed so that it has these transistors have a reliability uh, event. If they ex exceed a, a critical maximum, you don't have to maintain. This is not precision temperature control. You have to keep it below a certain maximum temperature. If you exceed, then the transistors do not function well or their life is shortened. So that's why the the packages uh, now one starts to track what is the power dissipated by these packages, and so you need to cool them. Uh, you have to keep them cooled, and depending on the package, if you are using it for a mobile phone, it could be two watts or so. If you're using it for a server, or uh, uh, for example, some of the high-end, many integrated core or GP GPUs, the power can be as high as 300 watts as well. So these packages now, they put in a motherboard, and that's how we put it in a computer. So this motherboard that I'm showing here, this is a board of a server. It's called a half-width board, and there are two uh, processors um, uh, in there. And uh, now the power that was 100 watts or so, now it's doubled, and there are memory devices and other peripheral devices that um, that 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 get integrated into the board. And so the power dissipated by the board now goes into the kilowatts. Once you get to the board level, then for a data center, now you have to put N number of these boards because the demand for information is quite high. And so you need to build boards after so many of these boards and all these boards have to work in unison as well. So they are called, if you put all these boards into a box and that's, it's like, uh, it's called a chassis, and when you put n number of these chassis, what you get is called a, a rack or a cabinet. 
And historically, from the World War II days, the rack height, the standard height is the 42U. U is nothing but a unit that is 1.75 inches. And that is the standard height of these racks, but these days for high performance computing for um, there could be racks that could be not uh, meeting the standard sizes, but typical standard IS racks are on the order of 42U. So, uh, which is about one to two meters. So at a rack level, depending on what you're talking about, whether you're talking about a Google type uh, uh, data center or some local uh, rack that is sitting in uh, in your office or in your uh, um, company, there the power dissipated by a single rack could be on the order of tens of kilowatts. But when you're talking about supercomputers, each rack could dissipate almost 100, even 300 uh, kilowatts of power, depending on the level of integration of these boards that was accomplished. And when you put all these racks into a big building, and that's where you get uh, the data center. So that's this is an example from Google data center where you see as if it's like an array of shelves. They are exactly shelves, but then they each of those are these so-called chassis, and each column represents a rack, and there are n number of racks that is running into a building, and they can be dissipating tens of megawatts uh, in general. And some of them tend to be on the size of uh, a football field. And uh, so there are many peripherals, devices, or um, uh, interconnects and uh, disk drives, storage drives. They also become part of the data center. I'm not uh, discussing those things. But in general, the idea is that this is the building block of a data center. And where you see is that at the package level, power density or the heat flux, that is the amount of wattage dissipated over a small area, the area uh, is, the, is very, very high. But at the data center level, the power dissipated, that is the wattage is high. So if you're designing a data center, one has to not just focus only on the data center level or the system level, but also be cognizant, especially for a supercomputer design, also be cognizant of what happens or the cooling that happens at the package level as well. So that's the building block of a data center at a very, um, uh, I, I, the very simply simplified view. And let's look at the heat flux challenge. Let's put some uh, ideas in some of the surfaces and um, some things that we already know. If you look at, uh, there are two types of power. In a package, uh, typically over the silicon die, you don't get to see uniform power dissipation. In fact, you see what is called a non highly non-uniform power distribution. That means you may end up having what is called a hotspot in a die, in a silicon die, and also uh, an average flux one has to dissipate, average heat flux. So the current day average heat fluxes are on the order of, uh, can be as high as 10 watts per centimeter square. So if you look at an equivalent, this is the average flux. If you look at an equivalent uh, um, in terms of um, uh, an object that we, are, uh, we already know or have come across is that this is equivalent to looking at some re-entry vehicle from uh, Earth's orbit or some nuclear blast. But the hotspots in these devices, in these semiconductor devices, could be as high as tens of kilowatts uh, tens of kilowatt per centimeter square, which is equivalent to going to be on a sun surface where the temperatures are quite high. But these temperatures, even for that level of heat flux, one has to maintain the temperature below, let's say, for example, 100 degrees Celsius or 373 Kelvin for, for that matter. So the heat flux at the package level is extremely important. And one has to mitigate the heat flux and keep these devices running at a colder temperature that is uh, that allows um, them to operate reliably over the life of that component or the device. So moving on, that is the heat flux challenge. But let's look at what is happening to the power challenge. If you look at the last 10 years, the, ch the race currently in supercomputer is to achieve what is called exa scale um, that people wish to calculate um, uh, 
exa flops essentially so a flop is the floating point operation and uh, if you look at uh, what happened in 2011 uh, the machine there is a, a organization called top 500 and these supercomputers are uh, ranked every 6 months um, and um, people uh, treat that as a prestige and uh, and there's a lot of competition uh, around this and uh, and to achieve the best uh performing com- supercomputer in the world so these are the over the 10 uh, last uh, 10 years or so and i'll just focus on the current 2020 which is the supercomputer from japan which is called fugaku uh that supercomputer uh, tops the list with 415 petaflops uh to give you an idea peta is 10 power 5 uh, 15 not 5 10 power 15 petaflops um 10 power 15 petaflops and um uh, so this is uh this is something that one uh what's being um expected is that in 2022 uh or so they are expecting to reach what is called the exa flop which is which is on the order of 10 power 18 flops and this machine is consuming 28 megawatts of power which is for a computer to consume 28 megawatts that's a lot and so but but that's the race and so the power challenge exists in uh, in a data center so how to mitigate how to get rid of this power and can we make use of this power is the current day scenario and how to make this data center or supercomputer growth sustainable is the current uh, the scenario and interest among various institutes and uh, researchers so if you look at data centers classification there are the so called public cloud providers and the scientific computers that i've been talking about and then there are the so called co location centers or the private clouds but there are many different classifications one can put into this there are the so called tiered cal- uh, ca- uh, data centers where tier 1 represents that there is no backup to that data center if there is a failure then the machine goes down and uh, on the other hand there are tier 4 data centers this, this is a classification um uh, provided by uptime institute and the tier 4 is a highly reliable data center where there is a 2n backup to everything so literally a tier 4 customer uh, will never see a failure and for the for the discussion of this webinar we're going to classify the data centers as air cooled versus liquid cooled because data centers are large warehouse sized computers that consume power and also produce heat so why cooling why is that important so if you look at uh, the power consumption uh, at a data center this is a very uh, a simple sankey diagram provided by rocky mountain institute uh, it's a very old um, slide but it's very um, um very much uh, informative so uh, so if you are producing about 100 watts at a fuel based power plant let's say a coal power plant of which a data center receives uh, about 30 watts after power plant losses and transmission losses in the system and out of that 30 watts 33% is lost to cooling systems and then about 1 to 4% to the lighting ups losses and so on finally once it reaches the it which is doing some calculation for useful some sort of a useful computing it's only ends up only about 1.5 watts and if you are just browsing the internet um and doing uh, no value addition to it uh, to your work or computation then the uh, the actual consumed power is less than a watt this is this is the current day uh, and the 2016 uh, uh, pie chart for us data center electricity use sees that the servers the it machines that are actually performing the computations consumes about 43% but the cooling and power provision systems consume about 43% so the rest is storage devices and networks and so on this 
This shows that the cooling is one of the primary consumers of electricity in a data center. So making the system, the cooling system, efficient and more um, sustainable becomes a, a big challenge. And people have addressed this and some aspects we'll discuss today. Um, so moving on from there, the temperature effects, uh, which is often referred to as as thermal management uh, can be felt all the way from the transistor level to a data center. As we uh, discussed about heat flux, so one has to not only remove the heat flux at the package, but one has to be cognizant of the fact that this heat needs to be ultimately removed from the data center itself. We can't dump it in that location because then the building itself will go up in temperature. So one has to carry this heat to a location where it can be dissipated. So at the data center level. So the thermal management is 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 an area where uh, many people focus on and the days are gone where the transistors or the chip technology is not the primary um, uh, uh, selling point, but more towards what is called packaging of these transistors and how one packages the computer or even the system, whereas you are interested in knowing what is the useful work done or the performance per wattage or energy that was spent to achieve that performance is becoming the paradigm, current existing paradigm in these systems. So to give you a perspective, a very simplified view of a data center that is cooled with what is uh, what's called an air-cooled data center is that all these packages, everything is uh, often most commonly uh, cooled using air because air, um, uh, just for um, joke, is cheap and easily available. So um, air is very uh, easy to, developing an air system is quite uh, reliable and easy uh, when the power levels are low. So if you look at this uh, picture, uh, um, our schematic is that the green data center building is where um, the air, the computer racks are cooled with air, and that air picks up the heat from the computer racks and goes to these blue boxes, which are called the crack units or computer room air conditioning unit. There, a water is being circulated. There is a heat exchanger in these boxes, a liquid to air heat exchanger, and that liquid picks up the heat from the hot air and cools the air down, and that cooled air is recirculated uh, between the racks, and, and again, that loop goes around. While on the other hand, the hot water from the crack unit, which is computer room air conditioning unit, uh, goes to a chiller, the evaporator of a chiller, typically, sometimes people try to use what is called free cooling, from the chiller, and the chiller uh, is cooled using a cooling tower. So that's a typical arrangement um, in in a data center, air-cooled data center. And one of the important things is to, how do I understand why one data center is doing better than another data center? So you need a metric. So a typical metric that is often quoted in the literature or often talked about in industry is the so-called power usage effectiveness. Note that this is an effectiveness metric. It is not an efficiency metric. That it is called, referred as power usage effectiveness, which is defined as total data center annual energy divided by total IT, which is the compute part of it, annual energy. So if this, the best case scenario is, if you get power PUV of one, then you don't waste anything all the power that you're putting goes into this computer. Otherwise, if that number is more than one, then you are you have losses in the system where, for example, for cooling the system, you are expending certain amount of energy in the form of fan power, refrigeration energy, and so on and so forth. But this PUV is a metric that is to address and understand the infrastructure uh, uh, performance. It is not a metric that can understand how an IT system works. For example, uh, life of a data center 
is typically on the order of 15 to 20 years. But the processes that are installed in a given data center gets refreshed or you, you, you start to see every, um, lately the technology um, is slowing down, but nevertheless, you start to see every two years new processes coming into the market. So over a period of 15 years, you cannot have a processor that you bought at the time zero, but you have to refresh the processes every now and then. And whenever you bring the new processes, we'll talk about how the processor energy efficiency is growing over a period of time. While the new processes are often very efficient uh, from the power consumption perspective. So if you don't do anything to a data center and you replace all your IT equipment with a new processor into that, you will find that even though the processors are now compute, uh, are consuming less power, the IT, uh, the PUV will go up because the IT power consumption is in the denominator. So it will give you a misleading information that PUV, for some reason, for new processes went up because you haven't adjusted the, the infrastructure, power infrastructure to, to accommodate the new efficient process that you're putting in. And the second thing is sometimes people do tend to shift their cooling or power conversion either into an IT hall or move the equipment from an infrastructure or a facility perspective, move the uh, power conversion or the cooling equipment, let's say an air handler, into IT, then the numerator will go down because now everything gets added to the IT side. So again, here's an issue that uh, PUV will appear as if it is very good, but you're still consuming as same power as you have done before, except that the PUV looks very, very nice to report. The third point is that temperature affects all of these. So when you are comparing PUV, you have to be cognizant of the fact that someone reporting a PUV at a temperature 27 degrees Celsius versus someone reporting a PUV at 45 degrees Celsius, they are quite different because all the processes have what is called leakage current and many devices have the temperature dependent performance. So you're not comparing apples to apples at that point. So PUV is a very challenging metric to use as a way of improving efficiency, but it does give you how effectively you are using um, the power. So to give you a perspective, a little bit deeper insight into this metric, uh, there have been some recent developments on, um, on what is called TUV and ITUV, uh, but these uh, TUV is total usage effectiveness and ITUE is the IT equipment usage effectiveness. So looking at the power infrastructure, if you see utility from the utility scale, we get the power and it goes to a cooling unit and to a UPS, which is the uninterrupted power supply, to a power distribution unit. This is all AC at this point. And from there, it goes to the wall because many of these servers and racks need very, very high levels of voltages and power. So you can't plug it to an ordinary wall. So you do need a PDU, which is the power distribution unit. And part of the electricity power goes to powering the cooling equipment as well, like a chiller or an air handler. So that from the wall, it goes to what is called a power supply unit. That's where the AC is uh, converted to DC because all these servers and all the computers that we have operate on DC power. And so the power supply units then supplies to the fans that are cooling the CPUs if it is an air-cooled data center or pumps if it is uh, liquid cooled. And then the VRs, VRs is voltage regulators because CPU these days need voltages on the order of one volt. Memory devices may require five volts and disk drives require certain other four volts. So you see that the power supply unit to voltage regulators, there are a lot of these conversion losses as you step down the voltage and the current goes up, the losses go up. So people have been improving all these aspects in IT, but nevertheless, a PUV is what you measure at the utility scale where A plus B is the one that is going to cooling plus B is the one that is sent to the power infrastructure divided by T. That is the one, the denominator is what 
the power that ends up going into the IT. So that is the PUE, power usage effectiveness. On the other hand, ITUE is nothing but G, which is the one that is supplied, the power that is supplied to the power supply unit, uh, not including the losses at the wall. And divided by I, the compute energy, which is the one that compute means only we are talking about memory, drives, and CPUs, not uh, the voltage regulators and so on. So this ITUE times PUE gives what is called total usage uh, effectiveness. There are issues around associated with it, but this gives better understanding of what is actually the real power consumption happening at the IT level as well as at the infrastructure level. Moving on from there, and thermal packaging, I'll go through this quickly uh, for want of time. And um, there are fundamental limits of power dissipation in these systems. One is the logical and the electronic. And, uh, but the current day systems, if you see, is that the efficiency is improving 1.5. Uh, every 1.5 years, the efficiency of a compute uh, operation per kilowatt hour of power consumption is increasing uh, twice. It's doubling every 1.5 years. And ultimately, what is called Feynman's limit will be reached around, it is projected to be about 2040. So there is a lot more room to improve the energy efficiency of these systems. So one of the greater advances in this system is that, if you see ASCII Red is a uh, world supercomputer, top supercomputer that was um, in that reached number one position in 1997, it occupied a uh, big room, and um, uh, you can see the square. Uh, it it occupied a lot of space, essentially uh, about 150 meter square, and consumes uh, kilowatts of power. And that and it produced a performance called one. It was the first computer to reach one teraflop of power uh, performance. And in 2013, Intel introduced a nice corner package, which is which consumes about 300 watts and delivers the same one terap teraflop of performance. This is, there are similar products from NVIDIA as well, but I'm pointing out that energy efficiency has driven this from a, such a large computer size to such a small processor now. So you are able to achieve the same performance uh, with a lot less cost about um, in, in the uh, nice corner, and that's the typical trend that happens. So if you look at power dissipation in, in a typical microprocessor, you have what is called standby power, and the other one is the active power. The power, active power is the switching power where there is electrostatic energy that is being discharged and charged. Every time you charge and discharge a capacitor, there is a certain amount of power uh, that, is, that ends up uh, dissipation, that ends up as heat. And there is the so-called unwanted power, the so-called leakage power that is happening because these transistors have become so small that you can't control the flow of current from what is called source to a drain. And there is one particularly important um, function which is called subthreshold leakage current, which is a very, very strong. It's an exponential function of temperature. So this subthreshold leakage has a very strong temperature dependency. So if you don't do adequately address the subthreshold leakage power that you can run into a thermal runaway situation as shown in this picture here, is that it can even burn the microprocessor because temperature rises, power increases, power increases, temperature rises. So there's a positive feedback and so there is a thermal runaway situation feasible in these systems. So one has to cool these packages adequately to keep these things under control. And that's what the aim of electronic cooling or thermal management is. The objective is to keep or maintain the device or die temperature at or below a fixed value to guarantee performance and reliability while dissipating power to a local ambient. Okay, I'm going to rush through because of time. Um, Uh, can you repeat, please? Six to seven minutes again, or more. Yeah. So I'll yeah I'll I'll just finish it. So what we'll do is that air cooling has long been recognized as one of the poor enablers of high performance computing, and so one of the important um, liquid cooling or water based cooling of computers is not new. 
It has been around in IBM mainframe systems for uh, back in uh, 60s and even up to 80s until the advent of uh, CMOS or the complementary metal oxide uh, semiconductor technologies. But this liquid cooling has now emerged as an important enabler of achieving high performance computing to reach what is called the exascale era. And what it does is that it brings a lot more interesting challenges to designing these uh, cooling design, coming up with cooling designs, because if water leaks, now you have, um, uh, when the water leaks, you run into a big problem that now there could be a short circuit because these are, are electrical drive, I mean devices. So uh, water leakage, serviceability, there are often in data centers many failures. The main failures could in in large scale data centers it could you could see up to hundreds of failures uh, per day. So these devices have to be serviceable at um, and so these. Uh, Water-based systems need what is called quick disconnects, but this quick disconnect should also not leak so that there is no problem and wait. Uh, when you bring in liquid, it's much more efficient than cooling with air. So, but if you don't use the liquid appropriately, then you cannot achieve the density. So what water or liquid-based cooling does is that improves uh, the density of the system. So, as you go, there have been the evolution of this liquid cooling from cooling only the processes to cooling the memory. And these days, what uh, emerging is the so-called immersion-based technologies as well, where you take the processor or the motherboard and dump it in a dielectric oil or fluid, which doesn't conduct electricity. So immersion cooling is not new. It has been around uh, even in 80s and so on but it does offer one of the highest possible density of packing of this. In high performance computing, it is about density, not about um, uh, you know, performance as such. So there are many varieties of this open bath immersion, and uh, we have done some work in the past to compare air cooling, liquid cooling, and immersion based. One of the common misconception is that whenever you think of liquid, you, you will think that liquid makes it easier to is much more efficient, but it is really not the case. If you look at the world's data, reported data centers from around the world, the PUV, you see that you get high, highly efficient data centers even with air-cooled. A here refers in this slide, air-cooled. Where you get advantage in liquid cooling is that the liquid cooling gives you density. So you can achieve very, very low PUVs with air cooling only, but Liquid cooling is important for data centers that have that house uh, advanced scientific computing, essentially high performance computers. So, with that, um, we did a very simple case study, um, and that is that when we talk about liquid cooling, uh, there is a common misconception that happens in the industry that there are some so called ASHRAE guidelines, which says that. Uh, you need a chiller if you want to have a water temperature as low as 27 or 17 degrees Celsius and beyond that, you can operate without a chiller. But this is somewhat misleading in some sense is that going to higher temperature water doesn't necessarily mean, and there are so-called hot water cooling is a, a very common buzzword in the industry is that so-called hot water cooling. But you don't need to run hot water, especially for uh, high performance computing devices is that uh, what people tend to believe is that warm, warmer water as you go up uh, at, uh, at very high temperatures close to 60 degrees you get more efficiency but it is not true because as you go to higher and higher temperatures leakage power becomes important there is the useless power that you're supplying becomes and for example a leakage power at 60 to 80 degree could be on the order of one watt per degree celsius so if you remove if you reduce one degree Celsius, you almost save one watt. So you could be unnecessarily running these process at a very leaky, leaky uh, mode. And so you have to come up with a temperature in such a way for cost and energy efficiency is that as low a water temperature as feasible without a chiller. That is the right mode of setting up. And for example, 
uh, NREL is a National Renewable Energy Laboratory in US. And their system, for example, because of their climate condition advantages, they can see that they can make what is called 27 degrees Celsius water throughout the year because of their climatic uh, advantages that you can achieve. They are able to achieve one of the world's most energy efficient operation, which is PUV on the order of 1.06. And they also recover the heat from that. And they use the heat recovered to comfort heating, melting the snow along the pathways they are walking and so on. Uh, so there are lots of advantages if you look at the system and they don't have chillers. So it is often thought that 27 degrees means you need a chiller. But depending on the climate and facility available, you can achieve very low temperatures. And that's why uh, some of the data centers in Prime Mill, Oregon, uh, Facebook runs is a climatically very advantageous position. So, so the code word for designing cost and energy optimum solution for high performance computing is as cold as feasible without a chiller. And also you can't go very low because the data center can should not go, the temperatures in the water loop should not go below the dew point where it starts to rain inside the data center. So you have to ensure that the dew point temperature, you're well above at least a degree or two above the dew point temperature and not uh, too cold to um, affect the data center performance itself. So with that notion, uh, we did some study on um, uh, on a data center at Chicago that was supposed to be uh, designed for 10 megawatts. And we found that if you are OK that um, uh, with 29 hours of non-operating the system, which is the um, climate condition in Chicago, you can get away without a chiller. But if you do have to operate even for that 29 hours a year per year, then you need just a booster chiller with a very, very low cost option. If you use a new chiller system, then the amount of cost that goes in because chiller is the highest expensive item in the in the list of purchases in, in a data center cooling. So you can it can cost up to $6 million. So that can be entirely adopt, uh, avoided if one designs for what is called the W3 or operating a system as low water temperature without a chiller as the as the paradigm for cooling these things and some results are there i will leave these in the um, in the website itself um, and coming to the conclusion um, is that current trends in hpc is that uh, people are moving away from air cooling to what is called hot water it should never be called hot water it's water cooling and then moving from performance to efficiency. But in the future, you will start to see more and more stacking instead of planar devices. Now you'll see more of the logic and memory is already there where you stack. It's a three-dimensional integration and the people are starting to shrink the computers to save the energy because a lot of energy is expended in just transporting the information from location A to B. So if you integrate it and shrink it, then the distance uh, the data needs to be transported reducers. So that's and what really has happened in the over the last ten years is that people have incredibly increased or decreased the PUV throughout by understanding the best practices in the world uh, data center operation. And uh, even though the installed capacities have jumped up, the efficiencies uh, has improved such that. The overall power consumed by the IC, ICT infrastructure over the last 10 years is only 3%. It was 3% of the world electricity, but it was 1% at 10, 2010, but it is only 3% at 2018. It didn't go to 20% or 30% as it was pro, uh, forecasted in the past. And I will stop here um, to take some questions. And there are some emerging trends on and some of these new technologies that are coming from force physics, Google DeepMind, and IBM Zurich. And I'll uh, I'll wait for the questions now. I'll close this. Thank you, thank you, Shankar. Wonderful uh, overview, and I'm sure it must be a lot of value addition to a lot of people who are working with respect to the cooling. Uh, may not be exactly for the HPC. Uh, a few questions. There were some questions, but uh, a few of them you 
answer it later one of which was about the immersion cooling but i think you have covered that thing the second question i feel is uh, how much temperature variations are allowed uh, for example if you are talking about let's say 50 degree centigrade or 70 degree centigrade do we allow plus minus 5 degree centigrade and also what about the humidity so maybe you can take up this question first yeah so uh, in general the data centers are designed in such a way that when the water enters the system and uh, the temperature rise that is often allowed is only about 10 degrees c uh, sometimes people even uh, uh do only 5 degrees c uh, to safeguard any thermal expansion related issues at the building level so it's about 10 degrees c is what is typically targeted but that means you are having to run lot of flow because you are allowing only a very limited rise in temperature um so that decision on 10 degree or 5 degree depends on the pump and the cost um uh, comes into picture at that point uh regarding humidity there are operators the, you know, yeah yeah uh, uh regarding humidity because these data centers are in a room and often there are failures and there are operators who are trying to switch the failed part with the newer part or doing any sort of maintenance on these devices so the humidity has to be in such that it is not uh, it is human comfort level that is about 40 to 50 degree celsius uh, sorry 40 to 50% rh all right yeah so it's basically the uh, as far as the delta t is concerned the so delta t and the flow rate compromise has to be taken care of right second question was uh, i think uh, a simple question maybe but in uh, for example in cooling we normally talk about cop but here you define something called as pue and that is is it very specific to data center cooling or generally it is used for other purposes also uh it could be used but uh, i have seen only used for data centers and it was started as a simple way to measure uh or compare data centers um because the Uh, if one has to delve deep into the level of how is how useful cop has the useful uh energy to uh total energy as the definition so that is often defined as what is called dcpi performance index data center performance index but quantifying what is the useful energy becomes challenging because in a data center you run variety of operations there could be a set of servers trying to just do only uh, information storage and retrieval of information but there may be certain servers doing computation so which and which one is useful versus which one is not useful becomes challenging to define so pv took off uh, very in a big way because it's it's a very simple measurement done at the utility once the power enters the data center itself and so that's right right, right. got it I think uh, there's a question from Kieran Banlin from BAE Systems. Uh, will liquid cooling see a reduction in the energy required for humidity control when compared to an air cooling data center? Um, um, did you understand the question? If there's a liquid cooling, will it see a hmm. reduction in the energy requirement for humidity control? I mean, the humidity around the data center, if it is related, liquid cooling and the data center. humidity control when compared to an air cooled data center um so in a data center if it is water cooled i mean or liquid cooled the the loops yeah. are typically uh, independent if i am trying to do climate control in the data center for operators then that uh, often is uh, independent so one has to uh, deal with a separate air conditioner that is running separately and the liquid water that was used for cooling um uh doesn't necessarily control the humidity in the humidity space for for right 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 uh yeah i think there one question from simon calling which is uh, related to the copy of the presentation yes the copy of the presentation will be on the website yeah fine so one last question uh, if there are no questions that come possibly in my way is uh, the futuristic uh, we are talking about now you know cooling for the supercomputers so let's say but also we are talking about now quantum computing 
Hmm. And the need for cooling for the quantum computing will be a, you know, I am dealing with very low temperatures and we are talking about now quantum computing for the next generation cooling. The cooling requirement will be very, very high. Can you comment on this or do, do you, uh, are you working in I, to quantum computing cooling requirements? No, I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm not quite conversant on the quantum part, computing part, but I, right. I do have, uh, uh, I do, I've been brought to, I mean, uh, I, I understand that now you need cryogenics to deal with it. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's coming to one Kelvin dilution refrigerators and everything will be required to come down to almost less than two Kelvin temperature. And a lot of people are working on the quantum computing because we are talking about now atomic levels basically. So uh, the cooling requirement has many, many folds higher now. There is one question from Ravi Kojak, yeah, from Indian Railways. Uh, would underground data centers, and this could possibly be the last question because I've got only two, three minutes left now. Would underground data centers using geothermal cooling energy be useful? Yeah, this question from Ravi. Do you think uh, geothermal cooling could be employed for such purposes? Yeah, people have tried um, um, using geothermal energy. One of the issues with geothermal is that uh, if you can't just use it only for cooling uh, in the sense that um, because the ground will dry out, if you keep dumping more and more uh, heat into the same location, then the area around that uh, becomes dried. And so eventually the geothermal uh, cooling uh, efficiency or effectiveness will go down. So one has to alternate between because what you see is the annual ambient temperature is what is imprinted at uh, 20 feet or below uh, the ground. Uh, so there one has to uh, cycle cooling as well as heating uh, for the seasonal changes to make use of geothermal technologies. But there have been some attempts, I guess, uh, I've come across some uh, some proof of concept devices that people have used using geothermal cooling energy uh, for but I do not know their long-term implications. Maybe it's a hybrid model, you know, that could be useful that uh, the day and the night or uh, from energy one, two, three, four sources, one can possibly yeah. optimize and play around these possible cooling sources. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Shankar. And with this, we come to the end of, I think only two minutes are left and uh, there are no further questions. If you want to add something to whatever you said, maybe I can give you two more minutes to talk about the emerging trends that are happening in this, otherwise we can call it the end of the day. Do you have something to uh, add in the presentation that we have had? Um, I think the last slide summarizes uh, uh, what is happening, is that there is a very uh, ground bear disruptive technology called force physics that is happening in air cooling, uh, where uh, they are using molecular beam uh, uh, an air uh, now focused into a molecular beam and cooling, and they are achieving very high performance cooling with that uh, technology, which is very new. It's a non-traditional cooling technology. And um, Google is employing uh, machine learning, and they have demonstrated that uh, one can achieve uh, very low. They were able to forecast that already Google data centers have a PUE on the order of 1.12, and they are claiming that now with this machine learning algorithm um, developed by their deep mind group, uh, the artificial intelligence group, that you can, they are able to reduce it even further. There is 40% reduction in uh, electricity cost. And the third one that is shown on this slide is the IBM Zurich uh, demonstration where you have a stack dice. Now, how to cool? This is the so-called embedded cooling technology that is emerging where you start to shrink the computer from a data center level to a sugar cube level. And that is the aim of this is to, a rack is now condensed to a sugar cube and they are trying to do at a very, very small scale all these performance, um, all these computations and so on. So this is the so-called embedded cooling that people from IBM Zurich have demonstrated and they have shown some extremely high performance levels with these. Um, so that's the emerging technology, some of the few. There are so many others. I just thought uh, I'll leave you with that. Yeah. yeah. Right. With that, we come to the end of uh, this webinar.
thank you very much uh, professor krishnan and thank you the audience a wonderful audience very silent audience and thank you very much for all the question that we've had i hope this uh, is a value addition to what uh, you knew about the data center cooling and please may you may give your feedback to natali and uh, uh, with this i thank all of you and i hope everybody keeps themselves uh, safe and uh, do very well thank you very much thank you professor krishnan bye bye thank you